All right, so we should be good. It is recording. So good afternoon, uh, Jude and Tala. Thank you both for joining me uh, today. We're going to go over some census work. It's the last day of Teacher Appreciation Week, and I know uh, the New Jersey Census did a whole like, you know, education week. So I wanted to kind of take this opportunity and sit down and chat with uh, you guys about the census. If you guys can give me a brief overview of who you are, what you do, um, and just talk to me a little bit about yourself. Okay. Hi, I'm Judith Hussain. Um, I do a few things. So um, something that I'm a part of would be the Philadelphia Youth Commission. It's an advisory group underneath the mayor's office that advises the mayor um, surrounding issues that involve anything youth related. So we stand by no decision about youth without youth. Um, I'm also a student at La Salle University approaching my senior year. So I'm um, just huge youth advocate. Um, so that really truly defines me. Yeah, super proud of you, Jude. Thank you for the awesome work that you are doing. Um, and I'm just gonna chime in, uh, triple major coming up, right? Triple major coming your way. Yeah. Uh, so um, that's really great. Uh, what are your majors, Jude, again? So I am a philosophy uh, major, a uh, politics major, and an economics major. So, but my focus is uh, politics. Amazing. Good stuff. Uh, thank thank you. you. Tata, go ahead. So my name is Tala Ismail. I'm the civic engagement coordinator at PAC currently. Um, I also studied politics in college as a double major, double minor. So not awesome. quite where you're at, but <laughs> I did no. political science. Uh, political science and law as my majors and my minors were Arabic studies and globalization and security and inshallah law school this fall well, yeah that's August. exciting yeah. that's super exciting yeah. so uh, I'm so super proud of both of you guys for all the things that you are doing um, you know and giving so much hope to the youth and really striving to to move our community towards you know a brighter future inshallah so thank you both for all that you do um, yeah. We are going to push forward uh, and talk a little bit about the census. Uh, this is a brief clip. It's less than two minutes. And I know that I have a lot of visual learners in my classrooms. So I always like to uh, sprinkle in some videos. Uh, so we're going to just watch this and um, we'll chat about it in a, in a minute. Put, the census is a head count of every person living in the United States. To be sure the government represents the people, the U.S. Constitution requires a population count every 10 years. Ever since 1790, the census has determined the number of seats each state receives in the U.S. House of Representatives. It is, and always has been, a cornerstone of our democracy. We still use it to determine representation but leaders also use the data to make decisions. Your response helps guide planning for the future of our communities. The 2020 census will help inform decisions on how billions of dollars are allocated annually for critical public services like roads, schools, hospitals and healthcare clinics, fire and emergency response services, and hundreds of other programs. In 2020, for the first time, you'll be able to complete the census online by phone or by mail. It asks a few simple questions, like how many people live in your home on April 1st, including their age and sex, and if there are any children living there. You should know that by law, all census responses are completely confidential, and your personal information cannot be shared with any law enforcement agencies. Every person counts, no matter who you are or where you live. So whether your family has participated for decades or the 2020 census will be your first. We all have a role in shaping the future of our country. Census or some factors of the census. Oftentimes we don't really know. Well, we hear the word uh, census, but do we, off, do we know like how deep it actually runs? You know, the census runs pretty deep, right? And starting with, uh, uh, you know, it is ingrained in the constitution. Um, so there is a, a census clause in the Constitution, which basically mentions that every 10 years there will be a count of the population in the United States. And what is really significant about that, obviously, that the count is used for representation. 
Um, and also how to allocate funds, right? The trillion, I think the number was 1.2 or 1.5 trillion uh, dollars of federal funding uh, is allocated based on the numbers that, you, that you know, the census receives uh, in terms of communities. Uh, so I am going to just talk to you guys a little bit about my experience when I was phone banking or talking to people about the census. So uh, there has been so much pushback on in on the census in terms of like people not wanting to uh, take the census because of fears like we don't know what they're going we don't know what the government is going to do with our information right that's that's a common uh, theme um, and, and rightfully so in a lot of marginalized community right a lot of marginalized communities have this fear of like not really uh, trusting the, the the government in terms of what they'll do with with the numbers right so we see here uh, immigration related fears and fears over how the data is used and stored uh, so I'll, I'll ask Tala to begin and then we can just start with this uh, with this scenario and how do we deal with it so I come across the same issues when I'm also, you know, out in the field and advocating for census issues, but uh, generally speaking, I approach this in a two prong uh, way. The first would be that I explain the Title I protections, um, or I'm sorry, Title 13. 13. Yeah, the Title 13 protections that, you know, if if anyone's information is leaked by an official, you know, the fine and the jail time and how the attorneys are also tracking, um, you know, making sure that none of these people's informations are being uh, sent out to the wrong hands. But I also try, and this is a little unconventional, and I don't know if I'm going to get some pushback on this, but I also try to explain that as an Arab American, I'm already fully aware of the surveillance in my community, and I'm already fully aware that if the government wants to find me, they will, whether I fill out my census or not. So I try to explain that because I'm also an EMT, for example, I'll say things like, okay, I ride in a town once a week and I go through the community and I can tell the demographics of an area that I work in just by working one night a week. So when people tell me, you know, they're afraid of surveillance and law enforcement, I'm very upfront and I'm like, police officers who work in a community, they already know who lives where, they already know the demographic makeup, the government already knows that there's Arabs in Patterson and Arabs in Michigan. We're only hurting ourselves when we're not filling out the census because everyone knows where we are already and now we're just not getting funding for it. So that's how I kind of circumnavigate that. So um, really great points, that, yeah. So some of, the, some of what I say when I'm out in the field and I'm just um, talking to community members and just family and friends, um, not only is it legally protected by the Constitution, like you stated, but there's also the 72 year uh, rule um, that uh, the census releases this data, but it's not identifiable to any individual. So it's kind of aggregated. So it's not based by name, it's based by trends. So for example, to put that in perspective, it's um, uh, West Philadelphia is made up of like 12% Arabs. That's the kind of data that is released. It's not by name, it's not by address, it's not by phone number, it's not by social, it's not by anything. That's the kind of data that is released. Um, and to put in perspective the 72 uh, year old rule, um, the 1940 census uh, data records uh, was just released in April 2nd, 2012, right? So like 72 years ago, that now is when it was released. So just to kind of put that in perspective when we talk about um, not only when we release this data, what does it look like? And then the timing of it. So when I'm out into the field, I think that really puts people at ease. The kind of data that is released, like how it is released, and also the time frame of when it is released. And another point to really bring up is the, the census counts people, right? It doesn't count um, whether you're documented, not documented, whether you're black, white, purple, um, Latino, um, Arab, whatever the case may be, it's just people, okay? And when we look at each other, we're kind of all in the same in that way. So I think it really um, puts people at ease when I'm talking to um, community members out in the field. Yeah, and I, and I think, um, but in terms of the data collection, yes, it is, you know, 
it is maybe that type of information you do want to get numbers and also for our community's sake you know in terms of representation uh, we are kind of uh, encouraging we are encouraging our community to identify as Arab American right so we are asking yes. our communities to make sure that they are identifying as um, Arab or or Palestinian or whatever um, else because like you said that aggregated data like that does make a difference in terms of representation and, 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 you know, just like, Hey, we're here, right. That kind of sense, mm -hmm. um, you know, going back to this distrust and, and the impacts that this has on our, on communities, uh, let's take a look at who is actually historically uh, undercounted and what are some of those ramifications, right? So we have young children between ages zero to four, uh, people who rent and are not homeowners. And we know that in North Jersey, this is a huge population uh, and people of color, marginalized communities once again, and people who live in large households. So these are traditionally undercounted uh, communities and that comes with a lot of ramifications uh, which we'll get into in a second. Um, I know any other um, points in terms of the undercounting in terms of the renters, people of color, or large households? I, uh, when I'm out in the field, a lot of people, um, a, lo a frequently asked question would be, you know, we come from like a divorce household, for example, where does my child, where does my child get counted, right? And we, before everything happened, um, National Census Day was April 1st, we said well, wherever the young person um, is located on April 1st, that's where that young person gets counted. Um, but now, as we head towards the end of the census going into the fall, it's wherever um, the young person is more so uh, where they stay. Um, and if that's the case, um, if that's not the case, usually people just count them, you know, whenever the census, um, they complete the census. So that's usually a frequently asked question. If we come from like a different households, where is my child counted? So that's up to, you know, the parents or the guardians or whoever is um, so whatever, care of the whatever, day you're, whatever day you are completing your census, whoever is in your household gets counted. Correct. Okay, so let's just take a look, a closer look at the undercounted groups and the impacts that has. So we mentioned children ages zero to four, and oftentimes like, okay, we're, we're not counting these kids. They're not necessarily out into in schools, but remember the, the census is a 10 year span. So let's say I have a, a, a one month old who's not in school and I'm not really thinking long term, but when that baby hits five years old uh, and I start looking into education programs, that's really where I'm going to feel it, right? So although they're not in school now, the, what you do today will impact the resources this child, this baby, this zero month old baby uh, will have when they enter school, right? In terms of Head Start, in terms of like the resources that the education, uh, you know, the districts in your in your community re receive in terms of resources, right? So resources like Head Start, Pre-K, uh, Kindergarten, Elementary Schools, all of that, all of that funding is impacted by the census. And I, and I cannot emphasize this enough because I am just such a proponent of quality education. And when we are leaving money at the table, we are leaving access such vital access to resources so please 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 make sure you count the babies um count the little kids every single person in your household counts and again i like to always yeah. i like to just say that because i i face this issue a lot especially working in patterson people are always you know apprehensive again about trusting the government and then it comes down to I try, oh, do you have kids? You know, they have kids. I talk to them about the education system. And I think a big misconception is that people assume that every child is automatically funded in a public school educational mm -hmm. setting. So they are assuming that if they're enrolled in the school, they're going to get the same funding across the board regardless. I always have to explain that in 2010, Patterson had a 40% response rate um, for children and that means, oh, I'm sorry, 60%, but that means that every 10 kids, only six of them were funded. And that doesn't mean that, you know, the four aren't funded, the other four, it just means that that six, that funding for the six students is now stretched and it's given to 10. So not one student has adequate access anymore. So it's not just a matter of, you know, your child, it's also a matter of the other children because now every single child's education and every single resource has been cut and divided. 
much because of a lack of a simple file or simple paperwork. You don't get resources just on the premise of enrolling. You know, you, the money has to come from somewhere. So I, we have to reiterate that point where if you want your children to get the best education or you want Patterson Public Schools to be as good as the other schools in your area, you need to take this seriously and fill out your census. Definitely. That's a, that's a really great point. So we take for granted, oftentimes we think we enroll a child in a school that they're going to get that. 10, 15, $18,000, whatever amount that is. But as you said, if you are not counted, that number gets stretched among multiple students. Right. Um, so marginalized communities, again, represent representatives in the house, right? The census depend like what you contribute to the census will impact the type of the number of representatives you have in Congress. Um, <clears throat> and we know with everything that's happening in the world today, what's happening with with our politics, that representation matters, right? Because if you don't have representation, if you don't have representatives who care about your issues, then you know it's really hard to maneuver in in this world without having a voice, right? And so when you're not contributing to the census, you're basically silencing your Yourself and you're silencing your community. Um, you know, 1.5 trillion of federal funding is, you know, allocated based on the census. Under counting means that you leave money on the table and other communities, you know, that are over counted get more of that funding, right? So you want to make sure that your voice um, is counted uh, because this translates into real, real you know, ramifications for the community, for your family, right? Public health programs, Medicaid, uh, public highways, and we mentioned schools, SNAP, and Head Start. All of these things receive their money based on the, the count. I, uh, to interject on that point, um, it's also used to analyze and predict trends, business trends. So economically, where is the demand? Where are the people? So where small business owners decide to open up? Um, where exactly they decide to open up. I think that's really important, especially when we talk about um, allowing our communities to thrive and to be successful on an economic level. Um, so I think that's a really uh, important point to point out. Yeah, for sure. And especially since we're going through, you know, the, the ramifications of the uh, pandemic now, uh, and then they're talking about the long haul of economic recovery, right? So having these numbers and making decisions based on the numbers uh, and trends, as you mentioned, is, is vital as well, uh, both for potential business owners um, and where people invest to, and develop. And just to piggyback off of the pandemic idea, I think now more than ever, we're seeing the overt need for census funding. Um, com communities are devastated by COVID-19 and it's really hitting minority communities disproportionately at a disproportionate rate. And that's for a number of reasons, but it's primarily because of socioeconomic and lack of resources. So this, the census, I mean, people are kind of overlooking the census. They're thinking, right. okay, I have bigger issues to worry about right now, which I totally understand because life is very stressful. But in the grand scheme of things, when you think about Medicare and Medicaid and hospitals and resources, PPE that we keep hearing about, ventilators, um, Education, again, goes back to, does every student have a laptop to take home or access to Wi-Fi? These are all things that the census could um, completely fund in the future. So God forbid we ever find ourselves in a situation like this again, our communities will be better prepared um, for a better future in that sense. Yeah, just to We are quarantined at home. Nine minutes, guys. Nine, ten minutes to fill out the census, depending on the size of your household. So, you know, it's crazy out here, but we got to do it. Yeah, um, uh, Governor Murphy mentioned in his uh, daily pre press conference a few days ago that Jersey was drastically undercounted, and that is impacting the amount of money that they have to work with now, right? When they think about who they're going to furlough, that's really scary, right? right? Uh, um, uh, furloughing public servants, right, that allow our communities to function um, is a scary thought, but, you know, we don't have the money, and a lot of that is due to, you know, the undercounting that that happened in the previous census. So New Jersey also lost a congressional seat in the last census as well because of the undercount. So it's super important for political reasons, economic reasons, education, the list goes on. Um, and I know we've been talking about what the census is, 
Um, so we know that it's something that was mentioned in the constitution for the count for representation and now funding. Um, but let's take it to a personal level. And I wanna ask each of you what the census actually means to you. So I, I can go first. Um, I serve as chairman of jobs and economics for the Philadelphia Youth Commission. And, and personally, um, as a youth advocate, it, and as a minority, as a minority youth advocate, right, as a Palestinian American, um, this instance means a little bit more to me when it comes to education, allowing um, young minority leaders to really get quality education because we see in all across the nation, um, not just Pennsylvania, Philadelphia specifically, but all across, we see a broken education system and, and that's just the reality of it. Um, and on a second note, it also means the economic prosperity that we can gain if we really truly understand um, what the census means. So um, we've stated um, throughout this conversation multiple times, how the census can impact our communities through local businesses and, and, and the benefits that we gain, but also like as a young person, being able to be in a thriving community with, with access to, to different opportunities, um, I think is really important. And coming from a very um, diverse community, um, ethnically and now locally, um, I think it's just really important that we give you know, the future leaders a chance to be able to have um, quality opportunities. Thanks, Jude. Yeah, I agree. I was actually going to talk more about education and opportunity because I think it's so important that young minds have the resources they need to succeed. But um, I guess since she covered that very eloquently, I will go into a more selfish and personal reason, which is identity. I think it's as simple as identity for me. Uh, for the first time ever, we can actually write in on our census our ethnic backgrounds. So instead of checking other and leaving it at that or checking off white and knowing fully well that I don't feel like I belong as a white person in this country, I think it's so great that I get to reclaim my identity for the first time ever. I get to write Palestinian in that box and I get to see that Palestinians are being counted. And if enough of us do that, who knows what can happen, you know? Who knows if the next census, Palestinian will be its own category, or if resources will be available in Arabic just because there's enough uh, Palestinians. And politicians will take stances that kind of align themselves with our cause because they know we have voting power. So for me, it's a big deal in terms of identity, in terms of representation, and just feeling like I finally belong in the American landscape. Yeah, I think that's that's very well put. I think for both of you guys, I'm wearing my Arab American uh, shirt, my Arab American uh, 2020. I'm wearing Pali roots. <laughs> I feel left so, out. I should have put my Pali roots on. <laughs> um, so uh, this is actually from the I, I believe it's the Yellow Count Me In initiative. So um, the census definitely. I'm just going to echo what you what you both you know you are you both are a representation of what our future looks like. You both are so bright and have so much to offer to the community, and it makes me like it makes my heart so full. And I think that's exactly what the census means. It means that we are now finding our place in this country, right? Although we've been here, but we are we are ingrained and we are part of the fabric of this nation, and we want to claim what you know. Uh, we want to make a stance with uh, identifying as Arab American, right? It's okay to be fully American and okay to be fully Arab, right? We're, we're, we're both of those things and that's okay. I know when I was growing up, there, you know, you had that kind of like identity crisis. It's like, where do I belong here or there? But no, we belong in both places and that's okay. Um, claiming identity and also equitable resources, right, and opportunities, because I think that is the foundation of any successful society, um, you know, providing that, that quality education. And I really hope that our communities do take part in the census and do identify, and, and so that we do have, um, you know, resources available for young people like yourselves and, and the generations to come to, to contribute to the society and to, to just make a stand that we are here, right? Um, so 
I want to thank you both for joining me today and having this conversation. I think it's very, it was inspirational. You both are my inspiration and my heroes. So thank oh, you. You're going to make me cry. Stop. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate uh, thank it. Thank you. Uh, before we leave, I just want to chime in, you know, how can you complete the census? Just so if anyone doesn't know, uh, you guys, somebody want to take that away for us? So there are three ways. For the first time ever, you can actually respond online via 2020census.gov, and you can call that number on the screen. If you go online, you can also find numbers for different languages. So if you want to call in Arabic, um, go over for Over 10 languages. Yeah, over 10 languages, which is pretty awesome too. That's the first time that's happened. The mm -hmm. online form is also available in Arabic. So if that's what you're looking for, go for that as well. And you can always mail back the questionnaire that was sent to you by mail. That would be standard snail mail, no postage needed, just fold it up and put it back. And um, you can also email me at tismail at pacusa.org or text the PAC hotline at, I don't have this number memorized, so stand by, <laughs> 973 seven six two seven and that is a text hotline available arabic and english as well so no one has an excuse right no one has an excuse, no excuse not to no. we're home we're home so do your part you know you you think it's something so silly but it's really not and it has real important implications for the future thank you both so much for coming thank you, for having and thank thank you so time. much we need to do this more often yes that was fun <laughs> right. yeah, thank care, you girls. Yalla, bye. Bye. bye.